Hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining Models.com's Industry Access. My name is Irene and I'm the Editorial Director of Models.com. I will be joined by Vogue's Creative Editorial Director, Mark Gaducci, Global Director of Vogue Runway and Vogue Business, Nicole Phelps, and Fashion News Writer, Jose Criales Onzueta. We have a lot to discuss and only an hour to do it, so I'm just gonna jump right in. I'm gonna start with you, Mark. You know, as Creative Editorial Director at Vogue, I'm sure your perspective has been that there's a lot of cultural pillars that inform fashion. To my mind, I think of Hollywood, but definitely art, sports. And before you st came to Vogue, or came back to Vogue, I should say, you were at Vanity Fair, and you went to Vogue, and then you went to Collage as the Editor-in-Chief. How did those experiences prime you for your current role? Thank you, Irene, uh, and thanks for having us. Thank you, everyone, for being here. There's a lot of people. As you said, I, I worked at Vanity Fair, I worked at Garage. Uh, at Vanity Fair, I was, I was a baby. I was an assistant. I learned everything from how to write an email to how to, you know, how to get something done, I guess. Uh, at Garage, I was only 29 when I took that job and had to learn how to read a P&L really quickly and um, how to think about, you know, we launched a, a website, which we didn't have before I started, within a month of me starting. and. That was a totally different sort of experience. But as you said, you know, VF thinks about fashion through the lens of culture and Garage thought about fashion through the lens of the art world and Vogue thinks about all of life through the lens of fashion, which is a different way of thinking about it. And that's what is what I find so amazing, not just about Vogue, but about fashion in general, is that because, to paraphrase uh, a famous movie, because we all wear clothes and we all get dressed, it infects everyone, even if you don't think it does. And uh, so when you open an issue of Vogue or go on any of our platforms, there's not just not just fashion, but there's fashion on uh, a politician and a chef and a celebrity, and it, it, it seeps out into life in, um, in so many ways. So I've never thought of fashion as living in a vacuum. As a creative editorial director, you connect Vogue's platforms with print, digital, video, social media, events. It's a, it's a huge thing to look over. I wonder how do you kind of manage the crossover between all those six different platforms? And then what's your process of kind of identifying new markets to like kind of explore? I mean, I don't think I um, look after any of them. All of them have, each platform has its own genius team and brilliant leader, and we all have one boss. Um, but <laughs> But uh, I am lucky enough that I get to work between all the teams. And I think that that is such a privilege, actually. But in terms of connecting them or finding new platforms, the one thing that I think connects all of it like, is curiosity in what's next, both for fashion, but also for how we present fashion and how, fa how we live with fashion, how we think about it. I was lucky enough last year to go to London and I went to see David Hockney had a new exhibition at a place called Lightroom that is a black box uh, experiential space that uses projection um, that Nick Heitner, who was formerly the uh, director of the National Theatre, had started and he was doing this exhibition with Hockney and I found, I found it magical, you know, I mean, some of those experiential spaces that you may have been to or know or friends kids have gone to are not so great and this was spectacular and so now this fall we're working on a, an exhibition about the history of the runway at Lightroom in London and that I think that's a good example of how if you stay open to how you can tell your stories we can keep going in new ways. Talking about digital Nicole I know that after you graduated from college you worked for different Print many, many. Yeah. <laughs> not too, not too far away. You worked at WWD. Yes, my first job in fashion was uh, as an assistant to an editor at Women's Wear Daily and W Magazine. We were on the same floor um, of a building on 34th Street, and it was the most glamorous place I'd been to in New York at the time, for sure. And so then you jumped into digital at style.com. When you made that decision, did you already think that the future was going to be digitally led or was it just an organic thing? 
Well, I had left Women's Wear and W to work at Elle magazine, and I spent uh, several years there and was looking for a new job when the uh, executive editor of Style.com called, and I knew her from Women's Wear, and she asked me if I would like to interview for her job. She was actually going to launch The Strategist at New York Magazine, and I was thrilled. I had become obsessed with style.com. It was born in 2000. This is the early 2000s. And it was a radical change maker in fashion. Uh, before that, as many of you know, you had to wait for lookbooks from brands to see an entire collection if you weren't at the show. Women's Wear Daily published a page one and a double. And the page one was in color. And the double was often in black and white. And you saw maybe one look from the runway. And style.com came along and suddenly you could see every single look from every single show. And it was so radical that there were brands at the time, very, very famous brands that made us take the images down after several weeks because they were afraid of copy artists. Eventually that stopped, I would say somewhere in the, you know, in the late 2000s. But when I decided to go to, to style.com, I told my editor at L, and she famously said, why would you wanna go work online? And so that was, uh, that was 20 years ago this year. And it's such an interesting thought process considering, I don't know if you guys saw the Cristobal Balenciaga um, show that happened on Disney Plus, but it, it's, it's so fabulous. It's so good. It's so good. Yeah. But, <laughs> but that was a sentiment. He's like, I don't want to be copied. I don't want to be put my, all of my looks out there because of that fear. And it seems now it's just quite common, right? Everything has to come out. And I wonder, you know, maintaining a luxury brand right now, it's expensive, right? Especially in New York City, people talk about rent, over, overhead cost, and all these things. And I think he, there was an article that came out when Carly Mark famously was talking about her moving her brand, Puppets and Puppets, overseas. And I know you guys came out with that article, I think after New York Fashion Week, about all the different ways that designers are kind of trying to make things happen for themselves. And I wonder what's your perspective on New York? I wrote that article for Vogue Business. I recently started a column called Connecting the Dots. And it was really connecting the dots about what the designers are doing here. Hello? Okay. <laughs> what the designers are doing here to, to make it work, right? And I think the impetus of that story really was to, to understand what everyone here, Hilary Tamer of Kalina Strata, Raul Lopez of Luar, um, Jackson Viederhoff of Viederhoff, you know, all the designers who are thriving or, or trying to thrive are doing to make it work. And I think the takeaway from that story is that one, you can do it. Two, it's really hard. Um, but three, there's a, there's a myriad of ways in which you can achieve it, right? And I think it's less about um, thinking about conglomerates and thinking about trying to sort of replicate models. I think the main takeaway from that story is that you have to find what works for you. I think there's designers, you're wearing one of them, Rachel Scott of Butima, um, Henry Zankov of Zankov. They sort of started their brands in stealth mode, right? They started, I remember when Harry started his brand, um, no one really knew about it. And that was, that was kind of what was great because he, he had spent years working at you know, DVF and before that at Donna Karen and like he was teaching and he was like, okay, I want to do this. Let, let's see how I can make it work. And then the other side you have, you know, I'm wearing him, Christopher John Rogers, right? Like when Chris launched his brand, everyone knew about it in a way because he was dressing all these celebrities and that worked for him. And eventually he geared his collections more towards day wear and he launched knitwear and he made it work. So I think the perspective or at least the takeaway is that what works in American fashion is for designers that sort of chart their own territory. And we've seen that with Anne Klein, we've seen that with Halston. That is the history of American fashion, of American sportswear. So that I think is something that we should preserve. There was that moment with Margiela. I remember you wrote about that. And I, the couture moment, it literally broke the internet. It seems like people are really wanted that, but can fashion still afford a kind of indulgent fantasy? What's the role of a show right now when it comes to brands putting themselves out there marketing? I wonder, Nicole, what's your perspective? I think it's hard to reproduce that that magic of the, the John Galliano Maison Margiela moment, and, and nobody really should uh, try to reproduce it. Uh, he is uh, sui generis, as they say. There's There's no one really really like him, but I know that it did trigger a lot of conversation. I mean, I was at previews in New York 
and uh, you know designers talking about how moved they were by how creative it was, and not just how creative it was, but how he had the time. Oh, I think it was a year and a half, right? 18 months that he worked on that. He had the time to do that, and so maybe the best thing about that show is the the questioning that it uh, will produce in in all of his peers, uh, designers asking themselves, "Do I have to do a show every six months?" Or you know, looking at Phoebe Philo and asking themselves, "Do I have to do a show?" at all. Remember back to the pandemic, we were all talking about how fashion was going to reinvent the system that we, we work in. We all seemed pretty committed at the time, but it really hasn't changed all, all that much. The system, if anything, is, is a little bit faster than ever. And sorry about that. And, uh, and that's a good one. Okay. <laughs> all right. And so uh, I think maybe it, it's just time for uh, we're in a moment of questioning and, you know, maybe it, the pandemic takes a year, you know, a few years to actually see what the impact is. And now we're actually seeing the impact a couple years, years on. And I predict uh, a lot more uh, designers asking those kind of questions. How can I break the rules? How can I uh, change, change the way the, the system works? I mean, you hit it on the head considering you brought up a lot of examples of designers who are trying to really push things out there. I mean, Dries Van Noten comes to mind, considering he was one of the few people who was very much adamant about the schedule that he wanted to adhere to. You mentioned the commentary. You mentioned a lot of people being quite vocal. Right now, social media has kind of offered the perfect platform for people to comment and talk and in some ways critique. And I wonder, as a fashion critic, what do you kind of feel like is the role of a fashion critic right now? Well, I'll just start by saying that the way I think of Runway is uh, we're both the front page of fashion, like the New York Times of fashion and uh, the Wikipedia uh, of fashion. And so we are a, a chronicler in, in real time. We, we used to say, hand in your review within three hours of the show ending. And it's a very hard, uh, hard task for, for a lot of people. Uh, but then um, we were talking about on the way over the reviews, uh, you know, as long as uh, Amazon, what is it, Wired Services doesn't let us down, those reviews will be up on the, um, the, uh, the Internet for, for all time and forever. so forever. And so uh, I think of Runway as a, an important service of being, being newsy, but also being an archive. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned the internet because that, that is where I started my career. Um, I used to be a designer for everyone who doesn't know. I used to be a designer. I used to work for a brand. And one day I was just like, you know what? I have something to say, um, <laughs> you know? And it just started on Instagram. And it was just me and the girls, just my friends, um, people just kind of like replying. And it just became a thing, right? It was right after the pandemic. Um, and through that, I started writing. I remember one of the first editors I reached out was Mahora Seward of ID girl, okay, um, <laughs> was Mahoro. And Mahoro was like, hey, like, do you write long form? And I'm like, I can, you know? And that's how I started writing, first contributing to ID, then I wrote for you. Um, and then, you know, I famously got the call. You know? and, and now I'm here. And I think what, what's interesting, my perspective on, on criticism and reviewing hasn't really changed, right? I think one of my favorite things that Nicole told me my, before, ahead of my first fashion week was, um, you have to think of culture, right? Like what is the culture or context in which something is happening? The role of the critic and the role of the reviewer, the role of the reporter in terms of fashion, especially when you write about collections as granularly as we do. Because we, we talk about every single collection, right? We're not sort of like giving everyone a sentence. We're, we're really reviewing each, each, each one of them. So it's like, for me, it's always, in what context is this happening? How does this talk back to culture? Um, what, is the what is the designer talking to? Like, what are the, in which context are these clothes going to live in? Um, and our job, in a way, is to, 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 to reflect that, right? And when you, when you put it in the context of what Nicole is saying in terms of an archive, what is so fun about the runway is that when you go back to read a review, you're like, what was happening at the time, right? Like, is, was it an election year? Was it, um, was it a designer coming or going, like who had just left their big job? You know what I mean? I think all of those things are very important and Well Runway, thankfully, is an archive where you can understand that. And the reviewers, to answer your question, TLDR, is how do you reflect culture 
um, through fashion and fashion through culture. I mean, I have to say my favorite thing that you guys just recently did, you started bringing out the real back archives, like re results, reviews from 1992, 91. I'm like, what's going on? I mean, speaking to viral moments, I know that the lovely Gigi Hadid just wore a huge scarf really dress to announce the Vogue World Paris announcement. And I wonder, you know, it's right before the Olympics. You guys are smack dab in the middle of men's fashion week, couture, and that. So why was that the right time for another city takeover? So uh, Nicole was just talking about how shows changed during the pandemic. And uh, in 2022, we were thinking about what to, you know, New York Fashion Week. We didn't really know what it was going to be that fall. And um, we had this idea. We uh, asked ourselves, what would the September issue look like if it was IRL? And that just led to all these conversations that we were like, okay, just like a, an issue or an editorial story, we're gonna choose an editor, find stories for them to tell in the collections, find a cast, find a location, and make something fabulous. But instead of it being photographs, it was photos and videos and a show that would be there for people in person and a globally streamed live stream. And, it was something else and it but it was editorially rooted and so um and that was something that we you know it was a success that we didn't expect and when we thought okay let's do this again it was inherently global because of the title and paris being paris uh you know it's like the alpha and omega of fashion um it's inevitable in fashion that we thought, okay, that will come, but let's go to London next. And we knew about the Olympics. We, uh, even then, we knew looking ahead that this would be such an important moment for the city and for the country, and it would give us inspiration to riff off of. And so that's what um, we're doing. We're working with the International Olympic Committee and Paris 2024, and we are doing Vogue World on the Place Vendôme, which for those of you who know, is sort of like the cradle of French fashion. And that alone took enormous amounts of diplomacy um, on the parts of many people at Vogue at the highest levels of the French government. So we're very excited. There's this connection that we keep talking about between the dedication that Olympians have from the time they're children, honestly, the way they dedicate their lives to a sport and that of uh, fashion, but particularly haute couture, thinking about the way that, you know, some of those ladies and gentlemen who work at those houses, that work at this one house their entire life, um, their entire career. And there's there's something in that that we're, we're playing off of. And um, what, what else can I tell you? It's a hundred years since the last time the Olympics were in Paris. And that century has given us a uh, framework to, to riff off of. There are going to be 10 chapters, one per uh, decade and we're pairing them with sports and we have the most amazing team. I'm so like I couldn't have dreamt of a better team but Kareem Reutfeld and Ib Kamara, Paris Goebel is choreographing and artistic directing the show and um, we're working with a curator called Alexander Sampson who's sort of like the Andrew Bolton of Paris. He works at the uh, the Palais Galliera um, and so does that answer your question? Absolutely. Yes. It was, we knew that the Olympics were coming. Yeah. I mean, you just men you just mentioned so many impressive parts of this. And I wonder, you know, it it's quite hard to represent a culture in that way. Is it also a collaborative effort with all your partners globally to kind of make that story happen? The French do things correctly. And so we are entering their space with respect in every regard. So all the fashion, for instance, will be French designers or designers who have made their home in France and we are going to stick to the leather of our permits. <laughs> there will be no going late. <laughs> We're also working with the, both the government authorities and the fashion authorities to make sure that it is absolutely inclusive. You said earlier that Vogue is an exclusive place, but we are making, making sure that it is as inclusive as possible. There will be uh, an entire section for students. All of the ticket revenue will be donated to the Paris 2024 Fund, which is working with a group called Secours Populaire to uh, ensure that underprivileged kids from fr French kids get to go to the Olympics and the Paralympics. We're approaching it French first, and of course, working with our French teams 
um, who have a wonderful new office in the second around this month. Just as a side note, the Olympics are the only time I'm patriotic. That's when I have my American flag and I'm waving it. So the tall part uniform. Come on. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. And you know, I I'll be wearing the French flag, but you can you can bring the <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll rep our side. Yeah. But, uh, it, it's interesting because you mentioned ticket sales, and I didn't know this was a ticket event, but I wanted to kind of inquire about like what are the metrics that you kind of use to measure the event's success in that way? So there are tickets for sale and they're not inexpensive but like i said those funds go to uh charity for us the metrics of success are based on how people see it around the world it's like uh, it's like going to we think of it as like going on set for a shoot that in that same way that the same editorial uh, mindset that i was explaining before it's like walking onto a movie set um, when you're there. You mentioned backstage that you've been planning this for over a year, and I don't know what kind of goes into event planning on that large of a scale because it seems to have a lot of moving parts and a lot of people involved, and is this just like the power of Vogue that you guys are able to bring all these elements to really do service by mm. by the city, or, or what's, what's the process? Um, I don't know if it's the power of Vogue as much as it's the power of an idea. When you have the Olympics and the idea of fashion and you tell that story and you get people excited about that, that is, I think, what brings people together. And then when you start to put together a team, the members of the team excite each other. Um, I can see some of the team in the room, actually. I think that people get excited by their collaborators, their, their team members. Not big to your whole day, considering you kind of let us know how to got your start. I wanted to go into some of the things that I've noticed and kind of talked about nothing was talking here. Um, a huge topic has been menswear, and I think that you brought a very interesting perspective considering a lot of times when you're thinking about plus size or curve, it's strictly within the women's wear market. I wonder what's your kind of perspective when it comes to size diversity on the runway, and you know, what do you kind of feel like fashion's role is in playing into the comfort and maybe discomfort that we perceive blind with bodies in fashion. What's your perspective? I think it's, it, discomfort is, a, is an interesting word and I think it's a, the most important word, right? Because I think this starts with language and it goes back to the word fat. People are afraid of the word fat. People don't want to be fat. People don't want to call someone fat. It's, it's not a bad word, but it is a taboo, right? And I think that's where it starts. Um, it, fashion and in general, the runway, like it, it can be a place for dreams, but it, it's also a place that can make you feel very excluded, right? Um, I look at fashion all day, and in, whether it's men's or whether it's women's, where in many ways I'm like, girl, I'm never going to wear that. You know what I mean? And it's like because of my body, and it doesn't, you know, it's because price point or whatever it is. But it's it starts there. But at the same time, fashion and the runway can be a place to alleviate that discomfort and to have all those conversations. Um, but my main take when it comes to you know, plus size fatness on the wrong way is that it has to be transparent and it has to be intentional. Like if you're not making the clothes to sell the clothes, don't don't put a fat girl, a fat man on the wrong way. You know what I mean? Because then what? You know, like then I see it and then I want it and then I can't have it. So I think it, it starts there. I think it starts with, yes, the wrong way can alleviate a lot of this discomfort. It can be a place for inclusivity and it can be a place to start a conversation. But if you don't follow through with the conversation, then we're just really just talking to ourselves, right? So I think that is my main point of view in that. Yeah, and I, I would like to add that uh, our colleagues at Vogue Business every season do a size inclusivity, uh, size diversity report. And uh, the, the findings this season were actually dismal. Like we had been making progress and now brands uh, are backtracking, especially in, in Europe. And so, uh, you have to sort of ask why, uh, why that's happening and why, you know, why is it a, why is it a trend and why has it sort of come and gone or it, why did it come and it seems to be going. And it's great that you guys have been season by season kind of tr tracking those metrics because I think that when you visually see it, it can be hard to understand if there's been a, a fall off or is there, you know, support of that. And I think myself, I'm focused on the casting and I felt like, yes, there, it just didn't, I didn't see as much as I saw the season before, even two seasons before. And it was palpable. It was palpable, it was palpable when you were at the shows and then to see it validated by the, by the data was, um, was uh, depressing.
Yeah. So it's like it, we all have to work together in various wh whatever element of the industry we're in to be vigilant and remind ourselves that that we have to think about it all the time. I will say also that uh, we did see diversity of a different kind this season. There were a lot of women who are, you know, aren't 20 years old or younger. Uh, look at the Ballman show. He was inspired by his, Olivier Rasting was inspired by his adoptive mother. And so there were women, you know, in their 50s, 60s, maybe even 70s. And uh, that his show was not the only one to, to have women who were significantly older than the, the typical age of a model. And it makes me think, uh, you know, is there only room for one kind of right. diversity at a time? Like why, why must we, um, it does start feeling a little bit like checking a box yeah. a little. Um, as, as happy as I was to see women my age and older on the, on the runway. I mean, that really, really works. And, it's, and when you go to a show where they're all skinny and they're all 22 or under, you start thinking, wow, this designer has a very, very narrow definition of beauty, of what's acceptable. And you start questioning, like, why haven't, why don't, why don't they open their eyes a little bit bigger? Yeah, it's, it's, and I think we, we go back to the, to the point of looking at fashion and looking at culture through a lens of fashion, right, which is asking all these whys. And we, we have all these conversations um, all the time in Nicole's office, right? We're like, close the door and we're like, okay. Um, but, but it's interesting because at the end of the day, you know, it's one, why are we sort of like switching which diversity we pick every season? Um, but it's also like, why is it now like women of a certain age? Why is it plus size at a certain time? Why has it disappeared? We're talking in the, in the context of Ozempic, right? We're talking in, in a lot of different cultural contexts and we have to start asking all those questions. Um, and reporting on them, which is also why this the 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 work that Vogue Business does, the think pieces that we do are so important um, in the in terms of sort of fueling that conversation that we're already having in our DMs and our group chats. We're all sending screenshots and being like, "Girl, you know what I mean." So I think it's important for us to um, we have a responsibility as well to start having those conversations. You guys also have your own panel conference called Forces of Fashion, and a little bit of nostalgia. I remember Fashion's Night Out. That was when I was a baby. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, walking through New York, trying to go into all these stores. But, uh, you know, you guys have been in the event space, you know, for, for a while. Vogue has never uh, talked about events the way that a lot of other media brands do in that, like, I think for many media companies or publications, uh, an event is like, the cherry on top of a lot of other things that you're doing like it's a you have a tent pole you have a bunch of people on the cover you get them all together you throw a party it's really fun there's a car in the middle of the party there's a 30 to 40 percent margin and everyone calls it a day that's not ever how we've thought about events uh, or parties we um same before I, I think we think of events as an editorial intervention into a real life moment and um, there, we were talking before about having an idea that inspires people and gathers people around. And a lot of, you know, what we're doing usually has a purpose to it that's bigger than celebrating an issue or um, something that's within ourselves. The Met, if you think about the impact that, uh, that that event has had going way back to the mid century, but especially in the past 25 years, it's not just about raising money, you know, as many of you, I'm sure most of you know, it is the primary source of funding for the Costume Institute at the Metropolitan Museum. But it's not just about the um, supporting that department within the museum. I think what Andrew and uh, Harold before him and uh, with Anna's help really have done is change the way that fashion is seen academically and in museums worldwide. And so if you think about that as, a, as an impact and the mission of, of that, that is um, a really brilliant way to, that, that kind of contextualizes, justifies, get, you know, every, does, it does a lot for thinking about the red carpet and all of the, the work that goes into it. Um, so it's never just a party. What challenges can you kind of think of when it comes to advertising evolving with modern media and all these different facets, not just magazines, right? It's online, 
it's events like this, it's events like Vogue World, where I imagine it's not as um, straightforward as like, oh, I'm just buying a page. I think that the advertising space across platforms has transformed so much. I really think of our, uh, as uh, fashion brands, more often as partners than as advertisers, yeah. you know? Like yeah. these days, there's so many companies that want uh, a way to reach fashion audiences that oftentimes the brands become collaborators in that endeavor that's useful for them as well. Um, and you were talking about the digital space and how that's changed and the metrics that go along with that and all the data that we have. Data is a double-edged sword. In one way, it's really amazing to be able to know exactly what your audiences are responding to and how they're responding, whether it means there's legions in, of people reading a story or whether it's time spent, which is the depth of, that people go into. Those are really useful things to know in term, and, and feedback to have for us. Um, but it also, you know, the platforms have done something where uh, they reify certain content, certain types of content. And I think we all are very aware of that, that certain things do well on YouTube. And that we have to be, we're, the, con, the kind of conversations that we have all the time about platforms are about how to make sure that we maintain our own identity, uh, whether it's a, a Vogue Runway or it's Vogue British Vogue or it's all of Vogue um, within those platforms. And I think the answer really is about, it's, that's always going to be a balance, but the answer really is about going direct to the, the reader. Going DTC, like figuring out a way to reestablish the relationship that you had with the print magazine and making sure that you can understand, you know, and having that relationship is, um, but digitally. I love DTC, considering that's normally how yeah. brands think, I mean, fashion brands, but you guys are thinking of it in the media space and all your different outlets. And I, I wonder, like, what role does Vogue Runway play currently for for today's climate, and what do you think an editor kind of has to prepare for? Well, we can talk about yesterday and the Dries Van Noten right, news right. and how we uh, were nimble with with that. I slept in a little bit till seven um, yesterday to my chagrin because when I know when I when I checked my email, I saw there was a letter from Dries in my inbox, and <laughs> I don't usually get letters from Dries. And so um, we realized that he was announcing his retirement and I, uh, um, I was texting Jose by 7.05 and uh, putting our, our plan into place by 7.30. Um, we had, we ha well, our colleagues at Vogue Business had, you know, had the time advantage there in London. We syndicated their news story. We prepared very quickly a historical look um, at Dries uh, in the, from the pages of Vogue. Uh, and, um, you know, by the end of the day, I had sat with Virginia Smith and is a lifelong uh, Dries obsessive. Uh, and so she told great stories about important moments in her life when she wore Dries. So, uh, nimbleness, but depth, I would say, are two things that we're always thinking about um, at Runway, right? Absolutely. I mean, I think I also slept in yesterday <laughs> till 7.15. And I wake up, I know, and then I wake up and like, oh, we know. <laughs> but yeah, I wake up and like, I turn off my do not disturb. And I'm like, oh, boom. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's part of that. Yes, it's, it's being nimble. And I, I love the word depth as well, because I think that is something that for us, a runway is very important. And I think that is, you know, going back to the DTC conversation, it's what's really, it's what attracted me to runway as a reader before I started working here. And it's what keeps everyone coming back. Um, but I think it's interesting, right? Which is sort of like, what is our take? What is our point of view? What resources from Vogue can we leverage to get to the reader? The, the Dries thing is a really good example, right? It's like, Okay, what 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 did Dries look like in the pages of Bo? Right, that is a beautiful story that only only we can do. Right, on the other side, like again, I have this column for Vogue Business, and I was writing about um, designers, and for example, Tom Ford transitioned out of his label, and what does that look like? What is the answer that that um, brands are like brands and founders are doing to to fill the void? Um, and I got a message from our colleagues, and they're like, Hey, how are we gonna fold Dries into into this that you're working on? 
And I was like, what do you mean working? I'm done. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah, you're nimble. You adapt and you, you find a way to tell the story. And I think those are the things you have to be ready for, right? You, you have to move on your feet. You have to be quick. And it's also about staying in touch with, again, culture and, and fashion, right? We, we know what's going on. So when things happen, you, you just, you, you, you are ready. I think you have to stay ready. Exactly. Yeah. If you do your research. Yeah, exactly. It's true. And I mean, it's, it's, it's what we, what we love to do as well, right? Like every morning we go into Nicole's office and we talk about what we're doing that day, but also what's happening and what we want to do. So by the time these things come along, we're, we're ready for them. Ideally. When you have the magazine, maybe you have a little bit more time for digital. Do you find that it's just a faster, a faster beast in a way? I mean, I think another example is Raf, where, where Raf Simmons announced that he was shutting his label. We were at the office. It was kind of a slow day, actually. It was gorgeous, you know? We're sort of like doing our little things. And then Laya, our colleague, just gasps, right? And I'm just like, what happened? And she, she runs into Nicole's office and it's like, Raf. And we're like, okay, what are we gonna do? And I think, again, digitally, um, we have the advantage that we can, we can think of our feet, come up with something, a way of covering it. And we're like, okay, this is sort of the first story that's going, which is announcement, right? And then what is the death? Um, Laya wrote, you know, a piece, like wrote the announcement. Um, Nicole calls our mower and was like, okay, can we have like a, a think piece about this? What does it mean? And then we all sat in a room and we're like, okay, should we, who should we ask about their favorite raft collections? Is that a good tribute? So we did that and we, you know, we, we started calling everyone, texting everyone we know, everyone we, we know who loves raft. And then by the next morning, this was at around 3 p.m., by the next morning we had this tribute right and it's something that again it's thinking of your feet trying to be again prepared you already know who loves raf you know who collects raf you know who's who's into it so by the time it happens you're just you're, you're ready and and you can provide the depth um, because you've done your research because you're prepared that's you know ideally what we do it's great because we've talked about the creators we talked about the platform, the media, but I also wonder what your perspective is as far as where the brands go, which is the retailers. In the past couple of months, you know, there's been Farfetch matches retail retailers that have gone out of business or, you know, are moving towards that space. And I feel like a lot of brands have been contemplating where does it all end up? Is it DTC or is it, you know, in other traditional spaces? I wonder what do you think the future kind of holds for digital retailers? I think that there are winners in the e-tail space right now. I think, you know, I don't hear too much negative about net a -Porte. I think, you know, we have colleagues at Essence, and I think that that uh, company is doing doing well, too. Um, but what, what we do hear a lot is, you know, going back to the designers, them... Uh, thinking about different ways to do business. So Standing Ground is a, a brand out of uh, London and he is an LVMH prize finalist and he is only doing special orders or taking orders directly from clients. And uh, at Vogue Business, uh, Megan, uh, our tech reporter is writing about a brand who is, uh, is taking orders and then uh, creating the designs via 3D printing, sort of doing one-offs. And so there, that's one avenue of, uh, of exploration. Designers, uh, it also is good in terms of sustainability and not, not using excess fabrics and, or you know, resources and not having um, excess stock. And can you think of other examples of uh, designers rewriting? Yeah, I think there's a lot of very exciting talent that um, you know, I've been keeping track on or like we've already covered or we're in the, on, in the works. With uh, Julian Louis, he launched. Uh, he used to have a brand years ago. It's 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 still in Vogue Runway because it was covered by Cell.com. Um, but now he launched a brand called Albert, and he is also in the LVMH. He's also an LVMH Prize finalist, and he's doing something really exciting where he talked to Roberto Cohen and Cinema Festival of, of um, Dessert Vintage, and they have a beautiful store here in New York, and they're based in Arizona, and they're friends. And he was like, "Can I just go to see sort of like what you have in stock of?" there's pieces of vintage that are unsellable, right? And he was just kind of like, okay, can I just grab these and turn them into something? So he quilted them on top of a coat and then put, um, you know, silk on top of them and then just preserved them. So I think, you know, he does those made to measure in the same way that Standing Ground does um, and then has a, a ready to rely on writer. Zoe Wallen, for example, she is almost in this, in, in, in this artist designer space um, and she's committed to making making this work for her, right? In the sense that, like, 
she's not really working a lot with wholesalers. She works with small boutiques. She makes everything herself or like with her friends in Brooklyn. Um, and she sources all of her materials are either death stock or they are cleanly sustainable or, you know, she'll drive upstate and be like, okay, I need felt and wool. And she'll just go around farms looking for felted wool, right? And the, all of these designers are rethinking what it means to have a successful business. I think it's also that, that we're seeing all these conversations arise, which is what does success mean to you? Is it being in every retailer? Is it having a robust DTC? Is it be, being your own bigger, biggest buyer? Or does it mean having something that you are proud of and you know having a business of the size that you want to have a business of? And I think Dries is a really good example of this, right? To go back to, to what's happening right now. He's built a business based on his ready to work. He's committed to, to, to creating something that works for him. Um, and I think we're seeing more of that. I think in a lot of the reporting that I've done through, through New York Fashion Week is talking to all these independent designers that are telling me like, yeah, I'm investing in my DTC. I'm finding new, new ways of, of reaching my customer, but I'm still working with, with retailers. Like wholesale is still important, right? It's finding the right partner and almost trying to see the future in terms of like what, what's going to work. But um, I think it's what we're seeing is redefining success and understanding what is it that you want. I imagine that all these brands are just kind of trying to navigate what works best for them. But I feel like it, the great thing about Dries is I think it's opened a conversation about what's right for you. And I think it's interesting to, on the, on the same vein, sort of see designers um, redefine how they present their collections, right? Um, I think something that I've, I've also learned through my time at Vogue is that I don't need to be at every show to understand what is happening in fashion, right? Um, that's also why Vogue Runway exists, right? Which means that designers can do smaller shows, they can do two shows, they can do massive shows, they can do activations, there's, there's, they can do concerts. There's, there's so many things that they can do to reach an audience today. Um, and I think that is my, my hope for Fashion Week is really to continue to see designers think outside the box in terms of how they want to talk to us, but how they want to talk to all of us, right? Um, as customers, as audience, as reporters, whatever it is. Um, so that's something that I'm very excited about. I think something specifically in New York is that, you know, there, New York gets a lot of flack for perhaps, especially this season, not being the most hospitable city for independent designers. And I don't, I don't agree. I think we have, I, what my colleague Laya always talks about is like, we have this, 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 you mentioned Willie, you mentioned Buar, Hillary of Colina is another example. We have all these new tentpole designers, right? That are who you want to see. and. That we should be excited about that and we should if they're doing a show we should show up to the show we should support it and we do um so that is my my hope to see to continue to see this sort of like next generation of whether it's stalwarts or tentpole shows arise but also to see designers challenge it and and you know send me an email and they're like i'm not showing i'm doing a, an event i'm doing a dinner and everyone's gonna wear the look do you want to come i thought it was interesting we talked about um in phoebe philo's recent profile in uh in the times she talked about how she wasn't interested in world building. That's not, that's not really what she thinks about. And how several of us, when we read that, thought, well, but you are. Because even if you're not going to do a show, and even if you don't think about the campaigns and all of the collateral that way, like, she's the world. And we know and where she lives in London and who her friends are and all of that. It feels very um, complete, I guess. It feels holistic. And so um, she's the furthest thing from an emerging designer, but still the idea that like she's approaching how to present in a totally different way. I think of the three of you and I'm curious as to, cause I'm always curious about how people got their start. I think it's it's interesting and, and who were kind of the people who led your way or were mentors in your kind of like establishment in the industry. Um, did you have any people who shaped your trajectory and what do you kind of believe is the best way to kind of build a network when you're first starting out and then even beyond? Well, when I was a, when I was a baby, uh, I, had, I wanted to go to graduate school. I was an art history student and I was working at Vogue and Sally Singer, uh, I remember telling, she, she was this, um, she's like the epitome of a modern editor in that it wasn't just about the line edit. It was like you would go into her office and just spit out a lot of ideas and she would gestate for a second and then come back and be like, okay, this is what it is. This is how we're doing it. And this is your headline. And this is the platform that it's for. And it was so, it was, she was genius like that. So when I had that um, conversation about my life with her, I ended up deciding I was going to go to grad school. And uh, I applied, I got in, I found a flat in London. I was going to go live in Europe. I'm a kid from Southern California and that was very romantic. 
and then I decided to uh, to resign. I decided to tell Anna myself that I was I didn't report to her. I just thought that it was a polite thing to do, and she flatly told me that that was a terrible idea, <laughs> and that uh, why would I need to do that? And uh, suffice it to say, shortly thereafter, I was uh, the arts reporter, and I did not go to school. Um, but um, but both of those women have been really important to me, and. Um, in various ways. I think, you know, Anna gets a, people talk about her as someone who, everyone talks about how dedicated she is and her work ethic, but I always think about how fearless she is for the causes she believes in, the people she wants to back. She uh, has a fearlessness in the way she approaches her work and her personal life that is amazing to me and I think is something I uh, continually admire. Um, and, you know, when I was at Garage, the, I talk about network. When I was at Garage and I was uh, quite young to have that title, and uh, even though it was a small publication, the thing I'm most proud about there is not any cover or anything we did, but about the people that worked there. Our colleagues, Laia Garcia Furtado and Emma Spector, Rachel Tashin, Gabriella Krefa Johnson, Evan Ross Katz worked there for a minute. Our assistant is now a celebrity stylist, and it was like that group of people um, is by far the you know, I learned more from the group of people that we worked with than um, any one person or any project. And Nicole, I know, you know, you're the global director of both runway and both business. So looking over such an extensive team, I wonder, how did you kind of even develop your own leadership skills considering it's not something that's a given and when you're leading an editorial team, like how you just described, you kind of have to be quite decisive and be able to kind of lead them and, and kind of shepherd them into the right conversation. How did you kind of develop that very important skill? Uh, I guess I was thrown into it when I took the job at style.com because I hadn't really managed anyone before, but uh, I had had a manager before that I knew I didn't want to be like. And so um, I, uh, I I learned as I, I went along at, at style.com. And, uh, and now I would say, uh, I don't know, uh, <laughs> it's hard to talk about management when um, when I have Jose right here. He, he might he might disagree with everything I have to say. Uh, every person you work with requires their own touch, and I would say that you uh, you have to learn very quickly uh, the way to work with each person individually, and so that is the challenge for for managers that uh, everybody is, who's working for you is different and they're, they're not like you. And so uh, you have to spend a lot of time uh, focused and concentrated in trying to pick up those cues from, from people. Uh, but what, 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 do we, what works? Honesty, uh, sincerity, and directness. Yeah, I mean, I think especially nowadays, it's really less about an org chart and who's managing, you know, who ramps up into, until very recently, actually, I didn't have it. There was no one under me. And I just kind of was between all these teams. And I think the only way you can actually really get something done at, to the level that, that we would all hope is if you're doing something that is inspiring enough to people choose to be a part of it. Yeah. And, you know, we're kind of winding down. It's been a great conversation, but I wanted to get your perspective on the next generation of talent, considering there's so many people who want to go up to fashion criticism, they want to be part of a media company, um, but they just don't know what to do. So, you know, just having the perspective, how do you, what would be your advice to someone maybe coming up in fashion criticism or coming up in media? Um, because you just mentioned you're trying to go to school and it was like, no, don't do that. <laughs> so what would be your advice or all of your advice when you're saying you want to kind of break into this arena? I feel like all of you have different perspectives and different ways that you did it. And I'm curious as to what you think on people that's what personally. I mean, I feel like I, I, I did it quite recently um, in the sense that I, I didn't work in media before I came to Vogue. I, I, I was a freelancer while I had another job. It was kind of like I was moonlighting as, writing or as a writer, right? Um, I think for me, the, the, the best space to network was social media. I mean, that's where I met you, um, you know, and I met a lot of my now colleagues at Vogue and people who have were at Vogue and left um, by now. That's how I ended up at Vogue as well. You know, I think it's it's a matter of networking um, 
and reaching out. But I think it's also it's less about like, hey, let me pick your brain, and more about like showing interest and curiosity. I I reply to every DM I get, for example, on Instagram, right? But I have I only have really good conversations when it's about a conversation, right? It's less about like, hey, tell me exactly how to do what you did, but more about like, hey, that thing that you wrote is interesting, but I disagree. And I'm like, okay, work, let's, let's talk about it, right? And those are the people that, that, that sort of circle around them become, and become part of your network. That's what I used to do as well with a lot of editors, um, sort of like slide into the DMs, but it's also about you know, showing up. Like if there is something like this and you can RSVP, show up, talk to people, you know? Um, that, is, that is, I think, the way in which I did it and it worked for me. Um, I think I was also very lucky um, and met a lot of people um, that were very helpful to me along the way. Um, but I think that's that's where I started. I started in social media and I started just, you know, replying to a story and just being like, hey, what's up? Yeah, I mean, I would say that Jose was doing his job before he got his job, you know, uh, on social media. And um, and now you just do it in both places. <laughs> um, and I think going back to social media, uh, you know, I think about Becca from style.com who I, who I adore or Sam Euclid. And those are both people who Sam Euclid is a photographer. Um, and those are both people who use Instagram, like their, their whole practice, if, if you will, is inherent to the platform, but they kind of flip the script on what it is, you know, Becca, the way he described what he did is he was like, he was like, I could never get a better picture than what people were going to see on runway. So I just decided to make the caption the picture. That was the whole thing. And choose a color and stick with it. And, you know, his kind of... And come up with a very good one. And come up with a very... <laughs> <laughs> T. <Tea. laughs> uh, but, you know, I think it's about being very clever about understanding how to get noticed within... Um, and Sam is sort of the opposite. It's very quiet. He, he takes... Uh, videos of people doing really beautiful quiet moments when he's traveling and they always stop me when I'm going through my you know it used to be we used to talk, talk about uh, stoppers as pictures in the magazine that would stop you and now it's like when you're scrolling there's something that stops you and his always do that and so I think that if you're trying to get noticed uh, that is something to always remember. I think if I can add something to on talking about the the criticism side specifically Irene I think what's I think one of my one of my first editors um, at ID, Osman Ahmed, told me like, what what's what's your thing? You know, I think um, my time at ID when I was contributing while I was still while I still had my other job was fascinating in the sense that like, they I I was coming from the internet. Um, I was very much still in the internet, but it helped me refine my eye into understanding what what is it that I care about and what is it that I do best. Right? We talked about menswear and we talked about menswear in the context of um, sizing, for example, that is something that I have a lot to say about, right? But it's also talking about queerness, gender identity, um, sort of the intersection of all these things between pop culture. Again, I'm a digital native, so I know a lot about the internet because I spend a lot of time on the internet, right? So how can I leverage that to have an interesting conversation about fashion? I think the, the most important thing right now, because there are so many people popping up, I was one of them, um, on the internet having something to say is, what is your take? You have to figure out what you are about and what you have to say and stick to it. I think that is the best thing you can do. Um, again, like for me at the beginning, it was about design. I came from design. So for me, I was just like, oh, how is that jacket cut? You know, and at first my audience was just designers and then it started growing a little bit more. Um, but I think that is my, my advice. And even when I meet with, with writers or when people in college who are pursuing fashion journalism, I'm always like, you have to find your beat. You know, it's something that we don't hear a lot maybe anymore because when you're a staff writer, you, you cover a lot of things. I certainly cover a lot of ground, but I, ha I have a distinct lens. And I think going back to the managerial conversation with, with Nicole is like, she, like, we have now this relationship where she knows what I'm about, right? So when I go in and I'm like, Nicole, I really want to write about fit pics. <laughs> it's just like this very specific, very online thing. And she's like, okay, great. What is it about? And you know, I write it and then she's like, okay, but now you're only not, you're not just talking on the internet, you're talking to a Vogue audience. So in that context, there are things you need to explain. There's things that, you know, are already a given. That's when you start having those interesting conversations as well, which is, you know, you have your eye and how does it fit into the publication that you're pitching or that you want to write for. Um, but it all starts there. What's your lens? You care. So now it makes people want to come to you or expect to come to you when you have a, an opinion 
or something is happening in, in pop culture. Finishing up things, I want to ask you, Mark, is there something mm. you can share with our audience in, as far as a teaser? What are we looking forward to with Vogue World? Yes. What should we expect? Smack dab in the middle of menswear. I, would, I would just say that one of the sports, you know, I said there were 10 sports for 10 decades, and one of them is equestrianism. So, yeah. Cowboy yeah. Carter. <laughs> Visiting Texas. <laughs> it's an international moment. <laughs> Well, we'll see what horses you guys bring in. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining Models.com and our Industry Access panel. Can you please join me in thanking this great gentleman? Thank you.